Hello everyone, Sanjay Saint here, and I'll be discussing fever with all of you. Um, we'll discuss fever, approach to fever, fever in a rash, and fever of unknown origin. And the material that I'll be presenting today comes from the St. Chopra Guide to Inpatient Medicine. First, let's start off with a definition. Fever is defined as a temperature of 37.7 or greater. And there's four general categories of disease that lead to fever. Infection is the most common and arguably the most important, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about the various types of infections. And the reason it's arguably the most important is that it's life-threatening, and it can be immediately life-threatening unless you diagnose and, and treat it. Malignancy is the second most common cause of fever in, in most um, case series, and there's many different types of malignancy, and we'll discuss those as well. Connective tissue disorders, especially things like vasculitis and lupus and rheumatoid arthritis can also be, give rise to fever. And miscellaneous causes, fever due to drugs, due to a DVT, or factitious causes of fever should also be considered. Four important points when discussing fever. The first is that patients who are elderly, immunocompromised, or on steroids, or non-steroidals, or NSAIDs, may not mount a fever despite a severe and sometimes overwhelming infection. The degree of fever does not predict the severity of an underlying illness. So even a low-grade fever can be a harbinger of a life-threatening illness. Hypothermia, or low temperature, may signal the presence of an overwhelming infection should be evaluated as thoroughly as we evaluate fever. And then finally, fever should be presumed to be secondary to an infection until proven otherwise because the infectious causes of fever can be life-threatening unless antimicrobials are given soon after the patient develops the infection. There are many different approaches to infection. The approach that I would recommend using because it's pretty thorough is a head-to-toe approach, thinking about anatomy and all the parts of the anatomy that could lead to some type of an infection. So you start off with the head, and I'm not going to be overly inclusive, but just to give you a sense of what this would be like. Meningitis, encephalitis, brain abscess, sinusitis, pharyngitis, peritonsillar, abscess, infectious esophagitis, then you get into the mediastinum, purulent and pericarditis, endocarditis, the lungs, empyema, pneumonia, the abdomen have all kinds of causes of infection, things like abdominal abscesses, um, as well as infectious colitis, pyelonephritis, prostatitis, pelvic inflammatory disease, skin and soft tissue infections, septic arthritis, etc. So by taking a head-to-toe approach, hopefully you'll be able to pick up or at least consider the most important and common causes of an infection. If a patient presents with a fever as well as a rash, then you need to be a smart physician to figure out what those causes are. And this is where the mnemonic SMART can be helpful, at least when it comes to the seven killer causes of a fever and a rash. So sepsis is one of those causes. Um, second is meningococcemia, especially when you see a patient who now is developing petechiae. Acute endocarditis can also give a fever and rash. Again, when you see petechiae, that's something that you should be concerned about. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is a rickettsial disease. Usually at three to five days after a flu-like illness, patients will develop a rash. It starts off with the ankles and wrists, and then it spreads uh, centrally, and it can turn into petechiae as well. Next are the toxic erythemas. This would be like toxic shock uh, syndrome due to staph or strep. Toxic epidermal necrolysis which is usually due to drugs. It's a SNAP to remember the drugs that lead to TEN, 
SNAP being sulfonamides, NSAIDs, allopurinol, and phenytoin. And then finally, travel-related infections. And travel-related infections usually are people who have returned from the developing world and have some type of a viral hemorrhagic infection due to Ebola or hantavirus. And usually when I have a patient who I think has a killer cause of fever and a rash, I have a very low threshold to ask an infectious disease doctor and a dermatologist to help me manage that patient. So let's say you have a patient, though, who has actually a fever of unknown origin or undetermined origin. The traditional definition is a temperature of 38.3 or greater for more than three weeks that's not diagnosed even after one week of a hospital evaluation. However, there's a modern definition because now it's unusual to keep patients in the hospital for a fever workup. And the modern definition of FUO is three outpatient visits or three days in the hospital without coming up with a diagnosis. And the disease categories that lead to FUO are the same that lead to fever in general. So I'm just going to highlight some specific examples. At least when it comes to infectious causes, I always think about the seven different types of infections that can lead to any type of fever, and especially FUO. So bacterial causes would be endocarditis and abdominal abscess. Mycobacterial causes would be tuberculosis. Viral causes, CMV, EBV, and even though HIV doesn't lead to a fever, it leads to other opportunistic infections that could cause a patient to be febrile. Fungal diseases, especially the three endemic fungi, histo, blasto, and coxy. And it'll be important for you to know the parts of the country and the world where you see these endemic fungi. Parasitic infections, especially um, in patients, you think about this and they come in with eosinophilia and with a GI illness. Spirochetal infections like syphilis or, um, or Lyme disease or leptospirosis. And then finally, rickettsial disease. Um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever is probably the classic one, but Q fever would also be in this category. So next would be the different types of neoplasms. Lymphoma is probably one of the most classic causes of fever of undetermined origin. Um, and you always need to consider that, especially if patients present with B symptoms and lymphadenopathy or a big liver, or big spleen. Leukemia, hepatic cancer, renal cell carcinoma, and atrial myxoma are also neoplastic causes of FUO. Connective tissue disorders include things like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Stills disease, and the various types of vasculitides, small vessel, large vessel, medium vessel vasculitides. And then in miscellaneous causes would be things like inflammatory bowel disease, drug fever, granulomatous hepatitis, or sarcoidosis, which can involve almost every uh, organ system and can present as an FUO. So there are many different diagnostic approaches to fever of unknown origin. Um, after doing a thorough history and physical exam and basic lab tests, you often will have to decide what to biopsy. And what you biopsy is based on Sutton's Law. So what's Sutton's Law? Well, Willie Sutton was a bank robber, and when he was arrested, they asked him, why do you rob banks? And he said, well, that's where the money is. So the approach to FUO in terms of biopsying things is go where the money is. If the patient has um, problems with their uh, white count and with anemia or with a low platelet count, bone marrow biopsy makes sense. If they have liver abnormalities, liver biopsy. Skin abnormalities, skin biopsy. Lung findings, lung biopsy. Um, so that's what people usually refer to when they say Sutton's Law. But perhaps the most important thing about fever of unknown origin is when you're confused to go back and retake the history. Figure out the travel, where the patient came from, if there's any pets, any other people that are sick, uh, because that often will lead you to the right answer more than any other sophisticated test will. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, and again, the material presented came from the same Chopra Guide to Inpatient Medicine. And on your screen is also a discount code that you can use when ordering it. 
Thank you very much. Have a great day.